naturally, this is part of the slide. So, okay. Uh, hello, this is me. I'm a, there's also people on the video, a little bit confusing. I'm a reporter with the Globe and Mail, an investigative reporter. I've been at the Globe for nine years now. <laughs> it feels like a very long time uh, to be doing anything, nine and a half years. And uh, in that time, I've done a lot of uh, investigative work on different kinds of stuff. All that means is that I, um, I go very deep on very niche subjects and, you know, uh, report those subjects out. Usually, you know, because we've gotten a tip that something is, uh, you know, afoot in a particular industry or area. Uh, sometimes it's because we feel like there's, you know, uh, there are stories to be had in a particular area. Maybe there's a narrative that we've seen evolving over time. So for instance, uh, you know, my last thing before this, uh, thing that I'm talking about today, was I was looking at the, it was after the, uh, the unmarked graves had been discovered at residential schools. And uh, a question that became very obvious but very quickly was why had the Catholic Church not paid residential school survivors what they promised them? Uh, they said at the time they didn't have the money. And so I spent the next year uh, learning everything I could about the Catholic Church's finances in Canada and how they did all of that. And that was very interesting. And uh, ended up, you know, the work actually made a difference, sort of, you know, in the end, the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops, which is, I guess, like the steering organization for Catholics in Canada, announced uh, tens of millions of dollars in new funding. So, you know, uh, it's the, sometimes the power of investigative work, I suppose. But today I'm talking about unlocking Secret Canada. Uh, this is a talk about freedom of information requests. <laughs> so this is a brief little, uh, a brief agenda, if you will. We'll talk briefly about FOI. Talk briefly about what Secret Canada is, and then the reporting, the website, which are the two components to this project, and then whatever at the end, we'll <laughs> go from there. So, FOI, what is that? I'm sure some, most, all of you know what that is, but uh, just in case you don't, <laughs> uh, or you've never used one, which is likely, FOI's uh, freedom information requests are these legal tools, these legislative tools that allow you to say, hey, public body, I want the documents or the records you hold. They can be any kinds of documents. Uh, they, they could be, uh, you know, memos, briefing notes, email correspondence, reports, research, data, video, audio, you name it, like a, anything that the government holds is theoretically accessible uh, through FOI for the most part. And when I say government, I really mean all levels of governments, uh, federal, provincial, territorial, municipal, crown corporations, all that kind of stuff. There's very few public bodies that are not covered under FOI law in this country. They're used extensively by journalists like me, by some academics, <laughs> we can talk about that later. Uh, activists use it a lot, political parties, businesses, uh, and it's often a research and accountability tool. So uh, this is an example of an FOI that I filed that Return. Well, this is an FOI that I filed, and then I filed a second FOI about the communications about my FOI, and this is the information about that. Uh, there's a whole backstory to this I can tell you about afterwards, but this became a story about how the province of Saskatchewan was trying to uh, get around my FOI request, and they emailed every other depart the equivalent department of the country saying, like, well, how did you deal with this? What did you do about that? So, you know, fun story for later, perhaps. Uh, as I said, you can request any kind of records, and it really can be anything. Uh, <laughs> sometimes the, the systems that exist to provide these records are not the best at handling this kind of stuff, like databases, for instance. Uh, some organizations will insist on printing off, you know, the tables and sending them to you, so that can be very annoying. But again, you can really request absolutely anything. So it's a very powerful tool, both for accountability and for research. And also just to learn about how the government operates. Often people filing FOIs may be public servants who are aggrieved in some way and want to learn about, you know, why was this HR complaint dismissed when it was, et cetera. She's nodding because she worked in the government. She knows exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, this is like a thing that really, it's a thing that gets used a lot. Uh, but, you know, there's a problem with FOI. Canada's systems are fundamentally broken. When I say Canada, I mean, again, 
all these different levels of governance that I described earlier. Uh, this was something that we already kind of knew going into this because one, uh, me and my colleague, uh, my reporting partner, Robin, have filed a lot of FOIs over the years and we've seen the slow decay in the process. Again, you know, police, municipalities, provinces, the feds, et cetera. Uh, and like preliminary conversations confirmed these kind of suspicions that things were moving in a bad direction. They were getting worse. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about what exactly the issues are in a second. But with all of that, you know, we decided, okay, <laughs> instead of just complaining about FOI at the bar with other journalists after a long day of work, we should actually try to do something about this. Use, you know, the tools that we have, the pulpit that we have through the newspaper to try to learn what's going on and maybe what can be done to fix it. So that is Secret Canada, this uh, project investigation endeavor, I guess. Uh, you know, Secret Canada has many components. We'll talk about this thing in a few minutes. But Secret Canada is a project to open up, you know, FOI and understand what's going on in this very complex, you know, Byzantine process. It's also a it has an extremely large public service component, uh, which is this website that I'll be talking about in a little bit. And uh, it's, you know, also kind of, a, I suppose, like an advocacy campaign for people to be using FOI in the first place. Part of the idea was if we build a website and we do the reporting and we build these resources, we can kind of <laughs> weaponize the system and get normal people to file more FOIs and learn about the system themselves. And that will help to agitate for change as well. So. Uh, it's Secret Canada is the culmination of 18 months of investigative work. At this point, uh, I'm being a bit conservative here, but I think we filed more than 800 FOIs, it's probably closer to a thousand. We've talked to more than 200 people, well over 200 people at this point. Uh, not all of them ended up with stories, of course, but uh, it's a lot of work, a lot of uh, paper work, literally, and uh, it's been, yeah, a very long journey. So I'll just talk a little bit about what I've learned along the way. Uh, our reporting has revealed that public institutions, and again, these are all those different organizations that I talked about. Most public bodies get covered under these laws. They uh, skirt FOI laws by overusing redactions, failing to meet legislative timelines, and claiming that no records exist when, in fact, they do, and uh, often face no consequences for ignoring the decisions set by, in some cases, the courts, in other cases, the appeals commissions, which are kind of like the like, you know, the, uh, I don't know, like the labor board equivalent for FOI. There's like a whole adjudicative system. And uh, it, those systems are also not working very well. We have, these are not just like, you know, feelings. <laughs> these are actual things that we've confirmed in our reporting. This is a, you know, a tight summary, I suppose. Uh, but our stories are like replete with like stats on exactly what do we mean when we say over and redactions. We have statistics that show the extent to which information is being redacted, failing to meet legislative timelines. These uh, laws, for the most part, say that FOIs have to be completed within 30 days. And uh, you can take one extension after that. But even with that extra extension, a lot of files are not meeting their deadlines, which means that uh, the governments and public bodies are breaking the law effectively. And uh, this no records existing, we literally encountered, encountered that ourselves and were now embroiled in this fight with the province of Alberta over it, which I'll talk about it in a little bit. So uh, I'll talk about the reporting really briefly. I'm just gonna check in with the chat, maybe. No, there's nothing. Nothing, okay. Am I going speed okay? Yeah, okay, great. Oh, now I don't know how to close the chat. Okay, so as I said, this project, Secret Canada has two components. There's a website and like public service kind of thing, and there's reporting, uh, which is, stories in the newspaper. Uh, I'll talk about the reporting first. So we began by publishing smaller stories last year. So we haven't just, we've been kind of building up the reporting for a while now. Uh, we started writing about some, you know, uh, obscure government reports about FOI last year. We wrote about a, a big federal review of the law uh, that frustrated a lot of people because they spent two years on this thing, ended up making no recommendations on how to change FOI, which, uh, you know, some people called a betrayal. Uh, 
And we also wrote about, you know, more specific issues like after the, uh, oh, I forget his name, uh, the teenager who was shot and killed in Baltimore, or was beaten to death in Baltimore, I want to say. I'm sure you guys all remember this, like February, January in the U.S. Uh, well, it was a very big deal. Uh, Biden had to come out and say, like, you know, the video is really bad. Please don't watch it if you don't want to. It was like a, a big moment in the U.S. again. Uh, we wrote a story about body cam footage and the inaccessibility of body cam footage throughout the line in Canada and why you can get that stuff in the States and you can't really get it in Canada. So we've been doing smaller pieces as we build up. And then eventually uh, we began publishing the bigger stuff, like the real like hefty investigative stuff over the summer in June. And we've been publishing ever since. So this is our first main story in uh, June. There's other pages that I didn't wanna, you know, it's so, I always think it's so funny to put like a print thing on like a website or whatever. I know that the website is probably more accessible, but at the same time, I don't wanna show you ads and whatever, so. <laughs> uh, but you can see the globe really, threw its weight behind this. This is like a Saturday front page. This is a big deal, uh, you know, to put this uh, in front of everyone's doorstep right across the country. And uh, we uh, have been publishing ever since. So our main stories, this is just a selection. There's a lot more. I've looked at, you know, why Hawaii is broken in a general sense. That's this piece here. Uh, we've also looked at how the federal how FOIs federally called ATIPS, access information requests, have been hijacked by the federal immigration system, which is completely bonkers. 80% of all federal FOIs that the government receives are from immigration applicants requesting their own uh, files. So there's an enormous backlog now of people saying, I want an update on the status of my immigration case file or whatever. And those are kind of grinding the entire system to a halt in a really crazy way. So this is a story that looks at that and the consequences of that, uh, including you know, a litany of public servants who said, we've been warning the Immigration Canada about this for 10 years <laughs> and they still have not addressed it and it's getting worse and worse and it's starting to have an effect on our ability to process immigration files now. So it's uh, you know, an interesting story. We have a piece about uh, Canada's island of transparency, which is Newfoundland. <laughs> Uh, Newfoundland, for like complicated reasons, has the most progressive FOI law in the country because of a series of scandals that happened in 2014, 2012, 13, and 2014 surrounding a very important hydroelectric dam project. Uh, and it led to, like, uh, because they amended FOI laws back then in a certain way, the government of the day had, like, they got swept out during the next election. Uh, people had to resign. It was a huge thing. But now they have this incredibly progressive law <laughs> as a result. And so they're a really interesting example of, you know, the ways that F it is possible for FOI to evolve, for the laws to evolve in a more open, transparent, progressive direction. But it did take an extremely crazy scandal uh, that rocked the province for a decade. And it's still, you know, you can talk to people on the street and they'll know what you're talking about when we say Muskrat Falls, the hydroelectric dam project. It's very interesting. We also did a piece looking at how other countries' FOI systems work. Every country is a little bit different. The U.S. system is similar in some ways and then completely different in others. So we wanted to do a little bit of a comparison to explain, you know, how is this, <laughs> how are they different? You know, what is Mexico doing that we're not? What is India doing? What is Sweden doing? Norway. So uh, we did that. Uh, more, more recently, we've uh, looked at the powers or lack thereof given to the watchdog bodies responsible for overseeing FOI law. Every province and territory and the feds have something called an information commissioner. In some cases, they're called an ombudsman. Uh, and they are like adjudicators of FOI disputes. So if you request something from the government and they say that doesn't exist and you say, ah, no, I'm, I know it exists. You have to. I need it, uh, which happens a fair bit. Uh, you know, these are the or, uh, the organizations responsible for figuring out what the hell's going on. Theoretically, uh, you know, those organizations are most powerful and effective if they have the power to compel the disclosure of records or say, this redaction is not appropriate, you have to remove it or whatever. But several uh, jurisdictions don't have that power, including Saskatchewan. So this is a story about Saskatchewan and the consequences of 
the uh, information commissioner only having recommendation power, which is not really a power at all. You know, I can recommend anything, to anyone at any time. So, you know, this is some of the stuff that we've been looking at. It's like I said from the beginning, <laughs> it's extremely arcane and specific, but uh, this stuff is important. You know, FOI does drive a lot of the core elements of, you know, just democracy and stuff. Like people don't really realize how important it is until it starts to really break down. Uh, a lot of uh, journalism comes from FOI, but also, you know, a lot of like citizen activism, a lot of small accountability stuff. Like why is this municipality spending this much money on uh, trips for the mayor? You know, like things like that can be really important. And uh, you don't really realize what you're losing until it's gone with FOI. So. We really wanted to. We really wanted to focus on this for that reason. Uh, our reporting has begun to have some impact already. Uh, I alluded to the province of Alberta earlier. <laughs> they have refused to process any of the FOIs that we filed, and we're pretty sure that they're breaking the law in doing this. Uh, they say that they're. We hear from our sources that they're testing some novel legal theories. Let's say uh, they're now under investigation by the information commissioner for this. They announced a what's called a systemic investigation, which is basically you know, a top to bottom, like what the hell's going on here uh, kind of look. Uh, and the information commissioners across the country have also begun to band together, calling for uh, the modernization of FOI laws in Canada. This just happened last week. So there's starting to be some movement now based on some of the stuff that we've been doing. Uh, so that's the reporting. Uh, there's more reporting still kind of to come. Uh, we have something coming at some point about uh, historians and how they can't, they have to use FOI law and it really sucks. Uh, and so they're like the academics who use FOI the most probably. And it's just, you know, Kafka-esque and very weird. Uh, but I want to talk about the website. So the website, secretcanada.com, uh, this is the thing I showed you here, uh, is a website that, uh, it's a, this is a core part of this project that does many different things. It's a, uh, you know, kind of a, Raw raw <laughs> FOI advocacy thing. It's also a database, which I'll talk about in a second. It's also an educational resource and kind of like a blog, <laughs> a news outlet of sorts for the smaller, like even more arcane stuff that we could, that there's no way an editor would let us run the paper. Like uh, this appeal happened, and here's what happened. Like they're not going to run that. <laughs> That's not a story. <laughs> so we, uh, yeah, right, here we go. Like a database of more than 300,000 completed FOI requests for more than 600 uh, at this point public bodies across all the levels of government. We have a lot of educational material, detailed guides on filing FOIs, on navigating the system, appealing decisions. I think this alone is like 20 or 30,000 words, probably. Uh, we also have a blog that we update semi regularly ish, you know, as stuff comes up and as we have time. The database is pr probably like the, the hottest ticket item on all of this, uh, this hottest selling point. It is uh, it was constructed from hundreds of FOIs. So we would we would create the same request and send it to every public body, every major public body in the country. So every ministry in the country, every minis every major municipality. So I think for that we did fifty in the end. Uh, so those were all the municipalities with a population of one hundred thousand people or more. Uh, every major police force, uh, every major hospital, every major university, including U of T, Crown Corporations, and so on and so forth. Uh, the school boards, fire services, all that kind of stuff. hydro companies, all that kind of stuff. And uh, it's a lot of work to do. That. This is, I realize, really tiny. This has been a, a crazy amount of work because we need to track all of this. So we have you know, hundreds of FOIs filed uh, with every round. We've, we're on our second round now. With every round, we're filing 400-ish requests. So you can imagine getting 200 emails a piece for between me and Robin from public servants saying, hello, like I have questions about this, you know, like here's the date that we think we can respond by, blah, blah, blah. It gets quite exhausting. So <laughs> we've had to learn to track it by having a lot of very annoying Google spreadsheets that, you know, inevitably we... Uh, lose track of at some point, but uh, we're getting better. Uh, the database itself is pretty powerful and pretty useful. So here's an example where I searched for potato and there were 75 requests in the database about potatoes. Uh, you can see the first one, no records exist, but there are others that do have stuff. You can see we have records for potatoes in this case from 
Prince Edward Island, of course, Newfoundland, <laughs> of course, and then BC and the feds. Uh, the FOI summary stuff, you can't <laughs> see it because the size is wrong. Let's see if I can fix that. Oh. Oh, okay, we'll get to that in a sec. Yeah, uh, the FOI, this FOI request page also allows you to re-request the documents. So you're kind of, we're trying to help people get any information that they might want very easily. We don't actually have the documents themselves. We did talk about doing that, but it was going to be a data processing nightmare. You know, our Amazon bill would have been like in the hundreds of thousands probably because we'd have to OCR millions and millions and millions of documents. So we didn't do that. <laughs> there was also like legal questions about that. So instead we built a database of metadata basically and taught people how to request stuff. And I think it's actually in some ways better because if you're interested enough, you will request the documents and you'll learn about the FOI process and maybe get kind of radicalized by how frustrating it can be. So uh, this is the feedback request. Hmm? This is the feedback request. Yes, yes. Uh, so uh, here's an example of a potato related, potato certification related request. Uh, if you are interested in any of the FOIs that are on our page, we give you a bunch of, we teach you how to request them. In some cases you can get them informally as they say, like that's the feedback that uh, Rohan's mentioning because some jurisdictions just make the documents available online easily. Most don't, uh, frustratingly. The alternative is you file your own FOI, which only costs $5 for the most part, depending on the jurisdiction. And we pre-populate a letter that will give you everything you need. So you just have to copy it and paste it into the right form or like online form or whatever and then you're off to the races. We know a lot of people have used this already, not just journalists, but normal people. I think <laughs> the top search when we published, uh, when we launched this was UFOs. <laughs> but of course, you know, the secret's out there. It's just uh, someone filed an FOI, the proof for aliens is just it's there. So we also have a guide to FOI or guides it to FOI. Here are like the three main ones. So, you know, how to file a request, that's step one how to navigate the process. So like, you know, all the many things that can happen to you during the process, that's step two. And how to appeal, most people never get to the stage, but if you have to, we've written a very detailed guide on how to do that and not lose your mind in the process, which is, you know, sometimes does happen. We've also built a lot of resources for people. So we uh, built a series of FOI letter generators with different templates. We have. 10 or 11 templates right now. Uh, you can request police files about yourself. You can request an immigration case file, email correspondence, reports or memos, briefing notes, uh, which are these like uh, one or two page documents used to like brief people on things within the government. Like uh, just saying like, here's a thing that's happening. Sometimes they ask for a decision or whatever. Yeah, okay. I did an okay job describing it. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's, you know, we have a form for how to request a government database. Uh, that one's too long, so I didn't do that one. This one here is about asking for documents related to a contract and a contracting process. So it, all you do here is you like plug in the information up here, put in the public body's name, uh, and then like fill in these other like little gray spots, and then you can copy it. And again, you're off to the races. So we know that a lot of people have used this too, and I found it pretty useful. Uh, and then we have this FOI news thinger that I was uh, mentioning earlier. So here's some recent stories, you know, uh, <laughs> this is a story about SIM swapping and phone fraud uh, that our colleague Alex uh, wrote about years ago. And so she wrote like a case study kind of thing. Uh, my colleague Robin uh, wrote about, you know, recently about some of the consequences that public bodies have faced for non-disclosure or for improper handling of records, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of consequences in Canada. This is a story I'm working on for next week. Uh, there we have, you know, experts talking about Ken Rubin is a like a god of FOI in Canada. He's notorious, especially federally. Uh, he is partly responsible for getting the federal law passed in the first place. So he's been busy for a very long time. He used to be like a staple on Parliament Hill because he'd be biking with his like uh, milk crate of like documents in the back. Uh, he's a very famous guy, uh, so he talked to us uh, about how a recent news story that was based on an FOI that he filed, how he got that, how he built the whole process looked like. Uh, you know, here's another piece about <laughs> researching private companies' ownership structure, something that you wouldn't expect to be able to do with FOI, but you can because it's a very powerful tool. So 
we have stuff going into this blog again semi regularly if <laughs> once a week is what we aim for uh and we found it to be nice because it's also like kind of cathartic for the journalist to be like a this crazy thing happened to me six years ago and I never got to tell anyone and it's not a story, but it drove me nuts. And I think people deserve to know that this happened, you know? And so we've, <laughs> that's something that uh, this blog can allow us to do. I wrote a whole thing about that FO, that meta request that I showed you at the beginning, the email thread in Saskatchewan, that became a crazy fight between me and the government. Uh, and, you know, it took probably like a year and a half uh, and they won for, reasons that uh you know i don't have to get into right now but uh you know it was very cathartic to write this story and say like well you know why did you tell me this when the emails say this other thing or you know why did you disregard the commissioner's order to release the records to me or why did you cite the wrong part of the law when you deny me access in a way that is not allowed or whatever so it was it's been nice. I mean, I, I know it sounds like I'm just like grinding my axe all day with this, but it, there's actually more to it than that. It is, it has been valuable. We get messages about these posts all the time saying like, you know, I learned something new today or, you know, that reflects my experience. I don't feel as alone anymore or whatever. So it's been pretty valuable. Uh, so I talked about impact for the reporting earlier. The website also has had impact. Uh, many, many people have reached out to us to say, I've taught my entire class how to file FOIs based on the guides that you provided and the templates that you've created. We've had people, you know, reach out about, you know, I found stuff in the database that concerns my, I don't know, like town or whatever. And like, that's really interesting. I want to learn. I'm curious to learn more about it. People are very curious, I think, generally. And they're also very interested in learning about how their government operates at all levels. And so this has been kind of nice for that too. Like we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from people saying, I didn't realize this was a thing that existed that I could use in this way. It's cheap, relatively like five bucks is not bad. In some cases it's free, Newfoundland. Again, they did a very good job. Uh, and uh, yeah, like uh, I've gotten a lot of emails from people saying I filed my first ever FOI today because of this. So that's exactly what we want from this website. Uh, we know that it's not kind of gonna be a kind of overnight, you know, thing it's got a really long tail and we've planned for that but it's been going pretty great so far so uh finally really briefly on what's next uh as i mentioned earlier more reporting to do and in the meantime we've we're just finishing up now the second round of requests to populate that database <laughs> the requests are kind of bonkers because we have to we have to tell them uh we need like these columns in this format do not send us anything other than Excel. It's like a three page letter at this point. Usually FOIs are like a paragraph. So <laughs> it's evolved over time. We wrote a whole guide that's hidden on the website uh, for public servants fulfilling our requests that answers every question they may have. So it's like the, the request actually says before you email us <laughs> because we're getting hundreds of emails, please read the guide. And I think it'll, it'll answer all your questions. And it has, I've gotten a few emails from public servants saying like, I have a question about this. And then 20 minutes later, they say, never mind. I read the guide. It's all good, which is perfect. That's exactly what we want. So uh, we're getting all these documents. I have a folder on my computer with like a 150 different Excel files. So we're going to have to spend a month or two cleaning those up, standardizing them. The dates are like all over the place, you know, month, day, year, year, month, day. Some of them are like just like the broken Excel numeric dates, all that kind of stuff. So we'll have to deal with all of that. And then we'll like shove it all into the database and it'll continue to grow every year. We plan to do this once a year. Uh, and then, yeah, uh, that's kind of it. And of course, when we're filing FOIs, because this is Canada, it's all still on paper. Each of these is a freaking envelope that we had to mail. Uh, it was a pretty, what's that? Oh, no, that's not me. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a lot of work. That's me and Robin in the office losing our minds after uh, sealing. I think that's about like 100 envelopes right there. Yeah, learned you shouldn't lick a hundred envelopes. <laughs> yeah, I think that's how George's wife died on Seinfeld. So, yeah. Anyway, uh, that's it. That's your candidate. I know this is like a weird talk because we don't really talk about data so much. It's a bit more about the structures that underpin it. But yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, 